Greetings everyone, Dr. Shane back with another Chemistry 125 pre-lab video. Uh, this one will be a little long, uh, but I don't think we're actually going to have one for the week after this. The week after this is the same technique for a different purpose. We may actually use the second lab in this one, the one after this one, kind of like a laboratory test to see that you really know what you're doing. So we'll see how that goes because they're both titrations. Okay. So the pre-lab questions, there are three of them up on the board. If you want to stop the video and copy them down, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to go over these, but if you'd rather just take some time and copy them down, and then you can work on them later, go ahead. Or you can just you know, stop the screen and work on them whenever you want. So I'm going to come out in front and uh, go over the pre-lab information, go over the sort of the sketch of the calculations, and then show you how to set up a titration and show you what to do and in many cases what not to do. So, here we go. Okay folks, uh, so just to go over this, um, the purpose of this lab is to, I guess I'll start over here. We almost we'll fell off the uh, stage there. Uh, we are standardizing a sodium hydroxide solution and it's aqueous, most of the things we are. So some vocabulary here. A standard is a solution of known molarity and you usually have a lot of sick things. So to standardize something is to determine what the concentration of a solution is. And it may be an unknown solution or it may be a solution you kind of know the molarity, but you want to get more sick things. Okay. So you have a standard, which you know the concentration, and then to standardize something is to determine what the concentration is. Usually it's a molarity or just some generic concentration. So then you make it into a standard. And actually the first pre-lab question is something called, what's called a primary standard. Um, in a sense, I don't want to give it away, you can look it up. A primary standard is something that you know works really well as a standard. And in this lab, our primary standard is called oxalic acid. This bottle looks kind of old, but there are some characteristics of oxalic acid that make it a really good primary standard. Okay, so let me just kind of review the calculation. So again, look up what a primary, and if you find a whole bunch of weird definitions, make sure you're looking up one in reference to doing a chemical analysis or chemistry, so it makes sense. You can always ask your instructor if you're not sure. Uh, the first pre-lab question, is something you should already know how to do from lecture, and it's solution preparation. So let's assume that you go to your analytical balance and you weigh 0.1246 grams of oxalic acid, dihydrate, I'm pretty sure in the procedure it's dihydrate, but double check that. So you'll need the molar mass of that, and you dissolve it, and this is gonna be tricky, into a 10 milliliter volumetric flask. So it's gonna be vital that every grain of that solid get into this flask. And then you know how to prepare the solution. I think we've talked about this before. So you put your solid in here. Uh, if you need to, the solid gets stuck to the sides, rinse some deionized water, wash every bit of the solid down into here, and then fill it up about halfway. It's a really small volumetric flask. When you come to the lab, prepare this solution immediately. Not, not with this mass but 0.12 XX mass, okay. You can put it on the bench and swirl it around or carefully hold it in the air and swirl it around. And okay, then you know what to do. You put the meniscus, once it's all dissolved, just like the copper sulfate pentahydrate, it may take a while to dissolve. That's why you do this immediately when you walk into lab. Go to your balance, prepare the solution, then do everything else. Uh, dissolve it completely, add water carefully, even if you have to use a pasture pipette, a uh, disposable pipette, excuse me, with a bulb going drop by drop, put the meniscus right here. This solution has to be made perfectly for this lab to work. So you prepare that solution. The first calculation is take your mass, not this mass, your mass, and calculate the molarity. So this is a warm-up question. So what would the molarity be of a 0.1246 grams of oxalic acid dihydrate dissolved in a 10 mil, and you should know how many sink things you get off of a volumetric flask, and report your answer to the appropriate number of sink things. That's number two. 
Um, I'm going to come back to number three, because number three is kind of a big calculation. All right. So over here, hopefully you can see this. There's a section in your textbook that's referenced in the manual that talks about titration calculations. Okay. In general, and I'll talk about this before, a titration is the quantitative addition of one reactant to another until you get them to what's called the equivalence point, that the mole ratio between one and the other, and that could be a two to one or one to one depending on the chemical equation, that you mix them in the perfect mole ratio and the reaction is complete. And then what you do is you calculate the amount of an unknown based on the amount of a standard. Okay, that may not make a whole lot of sense until I show you the apparatus, but that's a titration. And the way you do titration calculations both this week and next week, when you, we are not going to tell you exactly what to do, is kind of the same. Is you take your known information. What does that mean? Well, that really means two things. In class, in your lecture, your known information when you started stoichiometry was usually a mass, x number or grams of something, and you convert that to moles. Grams are not the most convenient unit to use in the lab because chemical reactants don't happen in the solid state very often. More often for a titration, instead of mass, you have a molarity and a volume. Molarity is moles per liter. Volume in the lab is usually milliliters. Well, that's fine. Milli is 10 to the minus third liters. That's no problem. And you use molarity and volume to get the moles of your known. So in this case, our oxalic acid is our primary standard. We'll know its molarity, we'll know its volume. That's where we're going to start this week's calculations. Then you get your moles of your known. Now you're kind of home free with stoichiometry. If you have a balanced chemical equation, which you do in the lab, uh, it's, it's a two to one ratio between sodium hydroxide and oxalic acid dihydrate. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna write that up here. It's already balanced for you. You, you could balance that though, it's not that hard. So then you go from your moles of your known chemical, oxalic acid, to moles of your unknown chemical, sodium hydroxide, for this lab, and, and then you get your moles of your unknown. That's, that's, that's similar to what you did in lecture, using that center calculation, x moles on top over y moles on the bottom. You get that one. Now it depends on what you're trying to find. This week, you're trying to calculate a molarity of sodium hydroxide. So to go from moles to molarity, well, you need to know what volume you have. Okay, well, you're going to know your volume from the data in the lab, and I'll kind of show you that. Or if you want to calculate the mass of something Okay, well that's fine too, because you can take moles into mass really easily, can't you? Just moles times molar mass gives you mass. Okay, so it depends on what you're looking for, but this is the general approach to a titration calculation. Uh, and the calculations will be a little bit different next week, but that's your job is to figure out how do you do a titration to calculate the molar mass of an unknown, but we'll get there, I'm getting ahead of myself. So here's a practice problem for you. Uh, the titration you're doing in lab is an acid-base titration, sodium hydroxide to base, a strong base. Oxalic acid is an acid, a weak acid, so it's a strong base, weak acid titration. Okay, that doesn't matter for now. So try this one. Um, let's assume in this case that your standard is sodium hydroxide, that you know what it is. You have a 0 0.1201 molarity sodium hydroxide standard, you, you obtained it somehow, or somebody prepared it for you, and you want to standardize, in other words, determine the molarity of, or the mass of, a sulfuric acid solution. So the first thing I want you to do is write the balanced equation. So sodium hydroxide plus sulfuric acid produces sodium sulfate and water. It's an acid-base neutralization reaction. Just make sure you know the chemical formula, sulfuric acid, sodium sulfate, and hit the balance, it's not too tough. You have to have that. Then let's assume that it takes 1.87 milliliters, so milliliters, molarity is moles per liter, okay, of the NaOH to titrate, and I'll show you what that looks like, 1.50 mils of sulfuric acid. And then do two things. 
determine the mass of sulfuric acid and then the molarity of the sulfuric acid. And that'll be a nice warm-up calculation for today's lab. And I think that's it. I want to show you the apparatus now. Um, okay, so I'm not going to go through every detail. I'm just going to kind of mention a few things to you and point out some stuff. So I have to go grab it real quick. And I want to check the video to make sure that it's looking pretty good. Okay, and I think I'm going to zoom in slightly. I think that'll help a little bit. Okay, just make sure you have all that stuff copied down on the front if you want it. You can reverse the video because I'm going to erase some of it here in a little bit. All right, so we are fast forwarding in time. So to do a titration, you need a few things. Uh, the procedure is explained pretty well. You're going to uh, have all this laid out for you and you'll assemble this apparatus. It's a pretty simple apparatus. This is the microburette. This is all in the uh, uh, handout. And it'll have this piece of tubing attached to the top. You take the syringe and attach it to the top. And you take this plastic tip and put it on the bottom. Make sure these plastic tips are on there pretty firmly. Okay. Uh, the procedure also says that you want to rinse the microburette with water before you do anything. I'm not going to show you that. You can, you can take the syringe off and rinse it down with water or put a beaker of water underneath this and pull water up into it and push it. Okay, so you rinse it with water before you do anything. Then you also rinse it with the solution you're going to fill it with. Okay, what does that mean? So um, here's how I'm going to set it up. One burette is going to be used to dispense. One burette is going to be used to titrate. I recommend labeling things, and I'm doing. I'm showing you bad examples today. So, in the procedure, you're going to use one burette to dispense your oxalic acid. So we're going to pretend that you made your oxalic acid solution. It's perfect. Do not try to pull the liquid out of the volumetric flask. The tip will fall off and get stuck in here. So pour your oxalic acid, not all of it necessarily, just some of it into a beaker. And I would label this beaker. Oxalic acid solution or use the chemical formula and put AQ. I'm not labeling it, that's, that's bad. Everything's clear and colorless. It's really easy to lose track of what's what. Okay, so you want to put some liquid in this. There's already some in here, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. Oh, this is a red clamp. Okay, make sure that's on there tightly. And you may have to adjust the height. And the syringe, by the way, is used just to draw the liquid up. You're not measuring the liquid using the graduations on the syringe. So you draw the liquid up. And what I always do, now I'm doing this backwards because I want to have this facing you, is this reads from the top down. So what you do, and I think the easiest thing to do, and I'm just eyeballing this because you'll see this much better, is I think it's easiest to start by putting the meniscus right on zero. And I think you should get three decimal places, so three sig figs on these volumes, I think. Or it should be 0.00. .00. So make sure you write down all the sig figs. I'm not, I'm not going to spoon feed all of that to you. So good. So in your lab, uh, this is actually not oxalic acid, but it doesn't really matter. So you have one microburette that's going to be used to dispense oxalic acid. Excellent. The other burette is going to be used to actually do the titration. I just want to look at the procedure. Great. Okay. So we're going to take one milliliter of oxalic acid, dispense it into an Erlenmeyer flask. It doesn't say what size, but I would uh, use the 10 mil because you're not talking about big volumes here. So, um, and we'll talk about writing a data table later. So actually what you're going to want to do for each trial, you'll want to record the initial volume on the burette. 
because you can just keep pushing more out. So the initial volume on this burette right now is 0.00. It, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to do this for argument's sake. Because this isn't going to take very much. So say you only fill it halfway. Well, that's fine. Just write down the initial volume. And then it says to dispense one milliliter. Okay. But now, the procedure never tells you exactly what to, to do. So, but you, you're going to write down more than one mil in your lab notebook. You're going to write down 1.00 mils. So you look on the side and, and you find your initial volume, add 1.00 to it, and push the syringe until you get that. And again, I don't need to demonstrate this, but you go carefully. One mil isn't very much. Now let's say you have a little bit too much coffee and you go past a total of one milliliter. Does that mean you have to start over? No, it does not mean you have to start over. So make sure you write the initial volume, the final volume, and if, you, if it turns out to be 1.05 or something like that, that's okay. So, you have a very small amount of oxalic acid in here. And then it says to do what? Using a graduated cylinder, measure two milliliters of water and place it in the flask. Okay, this is, I don't even know if you can see that. There's hardly any liquid, it's, there's hardly anything in there. It's really gonna be hard to see the chemical reaction. So you add some water. Now the procedure says, and do this, to use a graduated cylinder and pour two mils of water in there. One thing you wanna be careful of is that none of this that dispensed out of here, no droplets got on the side, because they won't react unless they're in the bottom. What you can do, how much water you add isn't that crucial. So I'm just going to do this for argument's sake. So I'm going to wash the sides of the Erlenmeyer flask down. And that's, well, that's probably too much water. I have a total of about five milliliters in there now, when the total should only be about three. But you know what? That'll probably be fine. But we'll find out. Um, OK, so your oxalic acid is ready to titrate. So now we come over and we titrate with sodium hydroxide. Yep, okay, so now you have, the other burette is what you actually use for the titration. So I've got some sodium hydroxide here and I'm just gonna draw it up. And I'm gonna do some bad example things. I have an air bubble in here. You don't want air bubbles. Air bubbles will interfere with your measurements. So if you do have an air bubble, because I, I drew the liquid up too fast, or I let the I let the tip come out of the liquid there because I was in a hurry. Well, make sure the tip doesn't fall off. You'll probably have to push all that liquid out and fill it up slowly again. And if you start at 0, 0.00, you'll have plenty in one burette full to do all three titrations. So you record the initial volume, Again, if it's 0, 0.00, awesome. Then you record the final volume to do the titration. That final volume becomes your next initial volume. Okay, and we'll make a data table. Okay, so the titration's ready to go. You have your acid here, dispensed it. You have your base here, and we're ready to titrate. There's just one thing that we, we have. We don't know when the reaction's going to be done. We have one clear colorless liquid going into another clear colorless liquid, a bell is not gonna go off when the reaction is at its equivalence point. And actually, we don't know what the equivalence point is exactly. So what we do is we estimate it by looking for something not called the equivalence point, but what's called the end point. The end point is using some secondary indicator, a color change, an electrical conductivity. Most times we use an indicator uh, that you've done before, and it's a color change. In this case, we're going to use phenol phthalene. So I'll try to spell that one. And if you Google phenol phthalene, it used to be used in a medicinal product. I'll let you look that up. Maybe you can write that down for a bonus point. I doubt your instructor will give you one, but why not? So make sure that you put a couple of drops. It's not crucial how many. I'll put, um, I'll put three drops in. One, two, Three drops of phenolphthalein, always put caps back on everything, swirl it. Again, that didn't change anything. Now, um, 
It's also helpful, depending on which ring stand you're using, to make sure that the platform is white. Because the color change is going to go from clear and colorless to clear and a slight tinge of pink. So I have one I did before. That is probably too much pink because I over titrated. I pushed the liquid in way too fast. So I'm going to try to show you what a good titration might look like. All right, well, first off, what is it? What is it? Let me describe it in words. Go slowly. Add the sodium hydroxide slowly. And the goal is, let me just add a couple of drops. So, can you, I don't know, can you see it turning pink? Okay. Swirl it. And if you, if you have not reached the end point yet, it'll go back to being colorless because the, now we've homogenized it and it's not quite done yet. A couple more drops. Swirl it gently. If you notice droplets hanging off the burette tip and they get stuck on the inside of the Erlenmeyer flask, a little bit of water, you can squirt it down in there. Oh, and I actually probably over titrated again. I made another mistake. It's pretty close, but I think, well, no, actually, maybe that's okay. Okay, a um, couple things can go wrong here is sometimes it's really hard to see that pink, slight pink color. The goal you want is for that pink color, very faint, to remain in the solution for a period of time with the addition of one drop. So when you get really close, the pink color will linger. I'm going to add one drop, see what happens. There goes one drop. Ah, there we go. That's not a bad endpoint. And it really turned pretty heavy pink because I added more drops of phenol failing than I did to this one. Okay, uh, that might be an over titration. It's possible. So the thing with this is now you know with one milliliter of oxalic acid, it takes about this much. Now, this, this is not oxalic, none of this has anything to do with the experiment you're doing. I'm just using other, I'm using actually hydrochloric acid just for demonstration purposes. The next titration you do is 1.1 milliliters. The titration after that is 1.2 milliliters. So it should get progressively more of the titrant here. Oh yes, vocabulary. What comes out of the burette is the titrant, and what's down here is the analyte. In this case, it's a little reversed because we know what the oxalic acid is, but I'm not worried about that. Um, Yes, yeah, so and the procedure mentions you want the color chain to persist for at least 30 seconds. Now, one of the interesting things is there's carbon dioxide in the air, and that actually, when it goes into the water, makes it acidic and will turn it clear eventually. In fact, if I would have been swirling this quite a bit over the last couple of hours sitting here, it'll probably turn clear again. Okay, so the goal for this experiment is to get three titrations that makes sense. Progressively more volume here should be an equivalent progressively more volume here. Then what you're doing is you're doing this calculation for the NaOH. So you'll start off with your oxalic acid. You'll do your mole ratio between oxalic acid and sodium hydroxide. And then you'll use the volume of sodium hydroxide calculate the molarity. Um, you can probably figure this out, but in terms of a data table, it's, it's not too terribly difficult. And you don't have to do it this way ahead of time. But So you're doing three trials. And um, I don't think the procedure tells you Okay, uh, we can, I'm just abbreviating here. So the uh, volume of uh, oxalic acid in milliliters, I, I think you can get more, I think you can get 
two decimal places on these. Excuse me. Now the thing is, if you don't have these exact volumes, that's okay. If you have 1.05, 1.15, and 1.30, that's okay. Just make sure that these are different so that you're not using a, what's that called, a self-fulfilling prophecy and getting the same measurement each time. Then what you're going to do is when you titrate, I, th I think this is on here, level well, we'll find out. If, if this isn't exactly right, so you'll want to record the initial volume of the NaOH, so you know where it is before you start the titration. Then you record the whoops, the final volume of NaOH in milliliters to, to go to the end point. That's just one way of doing it, I and F. Okay. Then you'll do a delta V subtracting these two, and that'll be the volume that you'll use in the calculation. I, I'm not sure that's really all that necessary, but a table is nice to help keep it, keep track of that. And again, progressively more oxalic acid should lead to a progressively larger volume of total to do the titration. And everything else is a calculation. Calculate the concentration of your oxalic acid in the ball flask, that's calculation one. Use the result from number one to do the concentration of NaOH, which is a multi-step calculation. Then do an average and a standard deviation. Excellent. Now, uh, I think it's in the procedure. Make sure you save the sodium hydroxide solution. I'm pretty sure that's what we're going to do. We'll let you know. Because this is the, oops, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, we're going to use the same sodium hydroxide solution next week. My bad. Ignore what I just said. And I think that's it. Uh, look ahead. I don't think we're going to do a pre-lab video for the next lab. The next lab is called determination of an unknown molar mass. The technique is the same, the calculations are different. And I think that's all I'm going to say about that. I might write a couple of pre-lab questions that simulate these calculations, but we'll see. And that should be it, folks. So uh, good work. Sorry for the long pre-lab. But uh, so as soon as you come in, to reiterate, make your oxalic acid solution right away. Get it dissolving. If it takes a while, let it sit. Get it all dissolved. Set up your apparatus, one for dispensing oxalic acid, one for titrating with NaOH. And uh, you can even get your three Erlenmeyer flasks ready to go. You should have three of these. You can even label them. One, two, three. Probably one. Dispense your dispense, dispense. Have all three ready to go. Titrate, titrate, titrate. One right after the other. And it can be a very efficient experiment if you are organized. So make sure that you are like you always have been, and we'll see you in Latin.